Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the annual meetings and welcome to Raising the Bar, What Works to Reduce Poverty and Spur Growth. We're about to start, so please take your seats and silence your cell phones. If you'd like to use those phones to tweet during the event, please use the hashtag #EndPoverty. One of our panelists will speak in French, and there will be simultaneous interpretation of this event in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic, using the headphones available on the table over there. So if you need headphones to understand French or English, um, please feel free to pick some up now. And now we'll have a short video that highlights some of the achievements of the countries on our panel. Okay, I was, th I was thinking the World Bank is going hip. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and very warm welcome to all of you at this uh, annual meetings of the World Bank Group and the IMF. I'm Jayla Pazarbaşoğlu. I'm the Vice President of uh, Equitable Growth, Finance and Institutions. And um, very pleased to have an excellent panel here today to talk about um, how how we can reduce poverty and spur growth. It's a topic which is very much at the heart of the World Bank's mandate, and we have a very distinguished panel today, um, and uh, including our own president, David Malpass. Let me quickly uh, introduce the panel before we go into our discussion. So to my left is Dr. Mohammed Al-Isis, Jordan's Minister of Planning and International Cooperation, and Minister of State for Economic Affairs. Jordan is a middle-income country which has continued to grow and promote investment in a rather complex and um, difficult external environment. Next to him is uh, Madame Aisha Tokane, Minister of Planning for Niger, a country that has uh, made substantial progress in reducing poverty and despite the many challenges in the Sahel region. Then we have our own World Bank uh, Group President, David Malpass. Economic growth and poverty are very close to his heart, so much so that when um, our president joined the bank the first day, he actually came to our poverty global practice to talk about the type of work that we do in countries. So it's really great to have you here, uh, President Malpass, in your first annual meetings. Last but not least, we have my uh, former colleague and friend, uh, Governor Dr. Patrick Nuroje, the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. His country is a very good example of how we can use technology to spur growth and um, increase access to finance and uh, reduce poverty. So, I would like to first give the floor to President Malpass in your opening speech or your positioning speech rather at, uh, at McGill uh, last week, you mentioned and stressed the crucial role of economic growth to uh, end poverty. Can you tell us a little bit why you think growth is so important? 
Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank, thank you, Jella, and very good to see the, the panel, and I'm looking forward to hearing their ideas on how each country is uh, working to get growth that, uh, uh, that reduces poverty and also creates shared prosperity. So the World Bank mission is clear on those topics, and the connection, if we think about it, it's very hard to achieve poverty reduction without having faster growth. That means growth that really benefits all of the people within the country. So what we've been doing, what I've been doing a lot of, is trying to work with specific country programs on the policy changes that they could make and also the programs that the bank can do, uh, the projects in countries that directly reduce poverty. So I, I don't want to uh, dominate, and I, so I wonder if can we go to each of the countries and of see course, course. what their thoughts are on of what works as far as creating faster growth in your countries. So I'd like to give a 60 second challenge to each of our panelists, the three government leaders, in terms of what they feel most proud of in terms of achievement in their country. So please. Thank you, Jada, President Mampas. Uh, excellencies, everybody, it's a pleasure being here. The past decade uh, uh, for Jordan is the embodiment of the statement, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We were hit with 44% of GDP in exogenous shocks. Uh, uh, our energy supply was completely, uh, uh, it completely disappeared overnight. We responded by going to solar. We're on track next year to have one-fifth of our energy uh, be of our electricity be generated from solar. Our borders between Syria and Iraq uh, closed as, uh, as they all uh, went through their challenges. As ISIS approached the borders, we lost 13% of trade overnight. We started exporting services with a click of a button. Uh, uh, our population increase has been the, the fastest uh, re on, on record. Uh, we received 1.3 million Syrian refugees in three years. Uh, we're a country of a uh, little over 7.5 million, and, uh, and that really stressed our resources. We had to secure our borders. We responded by doing a 14% fiscal consolidation to maintain fiscal and macro stability. And from there, we continued to grow, in spite of all of the above, at 2%. Yet, 2% at the population growth resulted in a GDP per capita drop of 14%. Hence, our biggest, I think, achievement is we stayed afloat in spite of the waves that have been surrounding us in regional turbulence. The challenge in front of us now is to go forward. Thank you. So, resilience. Resilience. Yeah. Madam Kane, please, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Thank you very much. As you all know, Niger is a country that's in the heart of the Sahel region. Niger has been dealing with various shocks over a number of years. And we have a major challenge, which is ensuring food security. Now, our greatest achievement since 2011 is that we've been able to put in place a vision that really um, responds to those uh, uh, difficulties. That initiative is called Niger, being fed by the people of Niger, the three N in French, Nigerian, Nourris les Nigerian. Thanks to this initiative, we've been able to contribute to more than 80% increase in our GDP. And today, drought is no longer the synonym of famine in our countries. We've been able to increase our agricultural production. I, I, but you said 60 seconds, so I'll stick to that for the moment. But currently, we are effectively reducing poverty through our 3N initiative. And this because is 80% of our population lives in rural areas. And rural poverty is really characteristic of our country, in addition to being female poverty most often. So we're really targeting transformation of the rural uh, world through this initiative, and that was the best way to reduce poverty and create growth. 
here um, with such an excellent panel. Um, the one thing I would want to say about, uh, if I were to choose one item uh, that, uh, to talk about, I think it is, without a doubt, the M-Pesa platform. This is a platform that was put in place in 2007, and uh, through it, it was really just a platform for transfer of money between persons. But um, since then, it has led to a substantial improvement in uh, financial inclusion, um, from about 27% back in 2006 um, to 83% just this year. And it has also created, or we've created an ecosystem around it um, that actually, um, you could say, is an elaborate digital financing ecosystem. Through this, um, we've been able, for instance, to provide options in terms of um, for savings. Um, we've also found other ways, meaning using the technology that is there, meaning we've got the rails, then we can put on the wagons. And I think this has led to a substantial increase um, or reduction, let's begin, in terms of uh, poverty, um, extreme poverty, and also other benefits. So it has a lot of potential go going forward. Two quick comments. One is uh, on the panel we see the d dramatic diversity of countries. J Jordan from Niger, from uh, Kenya, are v face very different problems, uh, and they do it by finding new and innovative techniques. I've met the leaders of the heads of state of all three, uh, and they're th in they're very different but they also are looking for ways to have an impact by changing their system. So it's, it's a, there's the commonality and the difference is all three. Yeah, and very impressive um, challenges you face as well as the achievements you have made in uh, difficult environments. If I could follow up on the uh, achievements you have laid out and ask you, how to sustain these achievements, both in terms of resilience, how to keep continue growing, and um, what, is, uh, what are the issues that you would like to stress in terms of um, these achievements? Um, Jayla, there is no way forward for Jordan but growth and job creation. L let's be very clear, the Jordanian citizens have gone through a very challenging time. Unemployment is at record high, 19%, and we have to grow our way out of this. There is no other alternative. And to undertake that, we've gone on a number of structural reforms. Jordan was selected among the top reformers by the banks, ease of doing business this year. The challenge is, as we're doing these structural reforms, there is an intertemporal challenge. These reforms will start paying due in the medium to long run. My concern is the short and immediate run. We have to give people a hope, a light at the end of the tunnel. We cannot continue going uh, pro-cyclical at times of slowdown. And we must attract FDI and exports in order to grow. The private sector has to grow. And the challenge is how can I grow it fast enough to absorb the numbers of the unemployed. There is something beautiful growing in Jordan. Uh, out of the 100 top Arab startups uh, selected by the World Economic Forum, 27% of them in Jordan, although our population to the region is 3%. The challenge is making sure that the short intertemporal time is actually addressed in order to maintain the momentum and not have a regressive inflection point. And for that, we must really think hard. How, what can we as a global community of economists and, and, and finance experts do to bridge that intertemporal challenge. For now, we're focusing on ramping up our social protection, mm -hmm. we're focusing on ramping up our human development services, and we're focusing on empowering the private sector. However, we must address the people according to their hopes and desires. It's very hard to continue going with such high unemployment, and we must address it intertemporary. So that's a, a very good point in terms of our priorities. You know, we have the international development assistance targets 
we have set ourselves for IDA 19, a key component is jobs and economic transformation because this is really uh, an issue that we face in, in many countries in terms of youth unemployment and hidden and unemployment and so on. So really thinking of policies that will unlock uh, growth and bring jobs opportunities are, are critical. Madam Kane, you mentioned, uh, and we also saw uh, earlier, that the basic health and nutrition services for about 3.8 million women and children from 2014 to 2018, actually with um, assistance from IDA, International Development Association. Can you tell us what were the main components of the program? How did you achieve these good results? Merci beaucoup. Donc, Thank you very much. I mentioned the 3N initiative, which is uh, the foundation of our rural development strategy. In general terms, our development strategy has been designed with a view to accelerating growth. And it's based on two main pillars. The first one is transforming the rural world, the rural uh, zones. And the second pillar is uh, promotion and development of the private sector. Because we believe that in order to achieve growth, these two components have to be dealt with in our um, development strategy. When it comes to transforming the rural areas, I, as I said, uh, Niger is a Sahel region. In the Sahel, you don't have rain in October. You don't have anything like what we have outside today. We have rains three months, just three months in the year. And so farmers produce during those three months for the whole year. And now, what has been changed by the 3N initiative? It is uh, that we've said we have to have production throughout the year. That means that you have to manage the water resources. The water that comes down during the rainy season has to be collected some how to be able to use it for irrigation. We also have areas in the country where we have the uh, Lake Chad, for example, and the Niger uh, River, and we have to use those water resources for irrigation and production throughout the year. Thanks to this, we've been able to increase the irrigated uh, areas by 300% over a five-year period. Now, during uh, what used to be the three-month farming season, farmers work very hard. But then, usually after that, they were they had no occupation. So what would happen? Well, young people, for example, would travel outside of Niger, what we call economic uh, immigration, to go down to the coastal countries to find employment. But thanks to these solutions that we've put in place today. Now, the young people remain in their farming areas at, for at least uh, six months or more throughout the year and continue to be occupied, continue to work on the farms. Furthermore, the initiative also um, is aimed at uh, developing um, the land that is cultivated. And our objective is 200,000 hectares per year. Um, um, uh, um, generally, it's only 100,000 hectares cultivated by year. So we've set the target at 200,000, which is already a start. Women's economic empowerment is also part of the program. Um, rural uh, hydraulic power production is also part of the program. Anything that can contribute to improving uh, the standard of living, uh, in, contribute to um, creation of wealth in the rural uh, world, is all part of this 3N initiative, which is a, a broadly holistic uh, 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 policy uh, aimed at developing uh, the rural area of our country. This is what I can say about the details. Um, <clears throat> the, the, one of the things that is clear, and I think this has come up uh, both the previous speakers, um, we are in a rush, meaning there is a huge need 
for jobs, meaningful jobs, particularly for our youth. So that's, a, that's one of the things that really occupies the minds of any policymaker. So that is essential. And I think there are many ways that it finds its expression in, in, uh, in language, in uh, speeches, and so forth. But at the same time, we should accept that this is a marathon. Um, and uh, a marathon, you need to pace yourself and, uh, if, and also be very clear what your targets are. One of the things we also need to do is to deal with the other factors that also support growth and support a proper environment. It's true you can begin with uh, doing business, you know, improving the environment for business, but it goes beyond that. Um, things like corruption and all that that may be somehow uh, in our systems also need to be dealt with. But the third point I would, I would mention is in terms of going ahead in the area of fintech or you know, financial, um, the, the ecosystem that I mentioned a moment ago, it is essential to put in to actually be um, sensitive to the needs of the community, of the people. So it isn't just doing uh, fintech products that are interesting technologically, but really to ask yourself what is what is needed by our community, our people. What do the people that uh, we want to lift out of poverty, what is it that they need? And very quickly, there are some things that are quite obvious. We talked about uh, vehicles for savings. Um, one of the things that actually 70% of the, of the shocks that drive people um, back into extreme poverty are health related. At least that is the numbers in Kenya and other places. And therefore, you need to deal with that. There's a clear need for that. Um, there's also, of course, a clear need for education. But I think another one which is very important is looking at the SME sector, which is where a lot of uh, growth is taking place, and that's where the employment is taking place. And we need to work to consolidate um, the gains in that sector. So those are the general points I would make in terms of going forward, the challenges, and indeed uh, the areas for action. Maybe I will come back to you, but maybe President Malpass, what are your views in terms of how do you see the role of the World Bank Group in these um, areas that, that the um, ministers and governor addressed? I, I was thinking of several things. One is uh, trade facilitation is important in all three countries. So, uh, and that we've di we, I describe that as ways to help things get across borders uh, with low transaction costs. That may involve harmonizing tariffs, or it might be the customs uh, border crossing itself. It might be the infrastructure across the border. So N Niger is, is, is working to build roads uh, that will cross borders and make uh, and bring other markets closer. We have a new report out last week, uh, the WDR, the World Development Report on uh, global value chains and the benefit to countries if they can find ways to participate in the value chain. So I wanted to mention that uh, uh, one common problem facing all three is uh, this, the challenge of cities getting bigger and bigger, and that involves traffic uh, problems, that's uh, water problems. Ouagadougou has uh, one and a half million people in the, in the capital now, and it's growing fast, and people need clean water and electricity in order to uh, have small businesses, uh, a starting point. So Kenya has a different, uh, Kenya has uh, managed to have digital currency, which has which has been greatly empowering for people at the at the bottom end, and I, I wanted to mention then the refugee challenge is is being faced in all three of, as, as, uh, in all three countries. People coming in from outside who may not speak the local language, who may not be incorporated rapidly into the into the labor force, and f f final point is the debt itself. So. Uh, underneath the current, uh, especially for Jordan and Niger, is, uh, it, it would, but really for Kenya as well, is uh, the pressing problem of rolling over debt uh, going forward, debt that maybe was accumulated in the past, 
that is not giving the growth benefits that are needed right now. So you're left with the debt and the debt service, uh, but not really with a clear path forward. So those are all areas that the World Bank is actively engaged in. Cities, refugees and immigration, uh, debt, and the rule of law issues that surround all three of those. If I can go back to you, Governor, um, to talk a little bit more about the specific policies you are putting in place in terms of jobs and SMEs and really um, promoting growth. Okay, uh, thank you, Jayla. In terms of the SMEs, the big, um, for Kenya actually, most of the employment is taking place in the SMEs. So we have to deal with the SME sector. And one of the things we've discovered is, of course, that they, there's always the perpetual um, need for finance. But, uh, and they, they need finance in a particular way. So over the last uh, one and a half years, uh, we have uh, increased our urgency in terms of uh, figuring out a way. And this actually, in some sense, was inspired by a policy um, that uh, was placed, that is putting in place interest rate caps, which we believe were highly damaging um, to the SME sector. But as a consequence, we have gone out trying to figure out um, how could we support the SME sector. And we've come up with various innovative ways. Um, in a sense, one of the things that we found out is the SME sector, or people operating in the SMEs, first and foremost, want a system that provides or ensures their dignity. That is important. They want to be respected as um, professionals um, that are working in this sector. Secondly, they want to have, uh, they want to borrow, they want to interact with their, with their lender anytime, anywhere. Mind you, we are now, I mean, Kenya is highly digitized in terms of financial transactions. 80% um, of uh, adults have uh, mobile phones. Um, and actually, in terms of uh, operations, maybe about more than 90% of transactions take place on the mobile phone. So anytime, anywhere is something that makes sense, um, given where we are with this. So we found ways, we found um, schemes that, uh, for instance, one of the things SMEs don't have is a good credit record. And one of the things a lender will do is to actually um, beef up a, a, a risk premium because they, they are not familiar with SME. So we found a way that the SME can create a track record. Um, and this, over time, say over three months, during which um, their, their rating improves and therefore they can borrow more and, uh, and, and uh, therefore expand their businesses. But it's not only finance. It is also um, finance plus. So they are, the idea here is we are bringing together finance and other, um, let's say, skills or ways of improving the, the business. So for instance, three hours study on something. So welders can improve their techniques, um, all within this package. And I think the point here is that uh, it's one of the many ways of helping SMEs, working with SMEs. But we believe it is, in a sense, innovative, because it, um, it uses what the SME sector has, which is information about their own transactions. So that's one general way of uh, dealing with SMEs, but, uh, but, I th but I think we are in a rush because, the, as was mentioned before, the need is huge, um, but we believe that this has, uh, has legs. Do you want to add to that? Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the metaphor used of a marathon versus uh, a, a speed run, it's very hard to do either when you're anchored down by debt. And, and we, our, our current instruments really address a country's situation when it's created on its own. The challenges when, you know, man-made disasters, wars, are like natural disasters. They don't differentiate between physical borders and you end up suffering from it. And this is a real challenge. What are we, what are we doing 
for countries that are poster child in, 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 in making the right reforms, in being good global citizen. I'm hosting, I'm the largest host of refugees in the world as a country uh, on relative terms. And we have a, a generation roaming the Middle East that is feeling lost. That lost generation can only carry with it its education. That's why we must cater to that education. We must invest in it. And we must be cognizant of the immediate need and the long need. Yes, we've done, we've done the largest program in fiscal uh, uh, consolidation. The challenge now is can I harness that for growth? And what we're doing for that is we took one of our biggest handicaps, energy. It's a handicap uh, that uh, uh, we inherited when the revolution took place in Egypt. We used to depend on Egyptian piped gas for our entire electricity generation. It got cut off overnight. We had to go and, and, and generate from the most expensive sources. Now we've adjusted to solar, as I said. In fact, you can generate solar in Jordan at the lowest absolute price on Earth, 2.4 kilowatts a cent. That's a great achievement. The challenge is I'm carrying with me that legacy debt, not only forward, uh, backward legacy debt, but also forward legacy debt. Uh, President Malpass, I know you're big on debt transparency. And we're trying our best to really address that issue head on. And you've been a true partner with us on that. The challenge is, can the existing tools at the disposal of IFIs and, and other partners really cater for such a challenge? Another issue we're addressing is we have to leverage the spending of government. So we're now focusing a lot on building a robust PPP pipeline. We've uh, revamped uh, the legislative administrative structure to streamline it so that we create a multiplier effect for every buck that the country puts into its economy. But we need others to take a bet on us. We need the IFC to come big with us. We need the EBRD to come big, invest in Jordan, EIB, and others. They've been doing that in the past, but we need to a renewed momentum. I cannot continue to be a global good citizen doing a global good of hosting these refugees, educating them. I'm running 204 schools on double shifts. I'm opening my hospitals for them. On my own budget, we have to come with a new approach to dealing with cross-country man-made disasters. Very good point. And uh, of course, we have our human capital project, which is really critical for the World Bank Group in terms of education, in terms of good health outcomes. And I'm sure David will talk about it. But I'd like to go to Madame Kane. And uh, you mentioned some of these issues and how you have been putting in policies to uh, deal with these challenges. Can you expand a little bit more on uh, what, what, uh, how are these policies, how are you able to continue with these policies? What do you feel that in terms of support you need? What is it that um, the global community can provide and what are you doing as Niger um, to make more advances? Thank you very much for that question. I wanted to uh, react to what uh, President Malpas said earlier on, on what the bank has done in our countries. But I'll come back to that later. Now, what do we do in uh, Niger? The uh, 3N initiative, but all the other policies that we have put in place, because there are many others. For instance, we are simultaneously carrying out several policies because we have a, an inclusive growth and development strategy on the long term in order to take on board all our challenges. We have climate challenges, demographic challenges, but also 
security challenges, very sadly. And unfortunately, the security situation will not be settled in the next two or three years. So those three challenges, plus the challenge of the human capital that you talked about early on, these are challenges that we have actually taken on board in our strategies for sustainable development and inclusive growth in order to come up with relevant answers. These answers have been included in our economic and social development uh, plan over the medium term. Now, what do we do to sustain all these results? We need a platform, a platform of reform that will draw on what we have achieved so that these achievements are irreversible. These reform platforms are relevant in order to promote growth in agriculture, in the private sector, but also in areas of human capital, such as uh, population policies, how can we reduce the fertility rate, etc., or index, etc. All that taken together will allow us to sustain these achievements. But uh, there is still a lot of work that remains to be done. Now, I do want to come back to what President Malpas has said. He said that what is important is to facilitate trade. Niger is a landlocked country. We are a country that needs to be open to others to survive. With the World Bank, we have a uh, programme of routes routes that allows us to have access to the Nigerian market, our neighbour, 200 million inhabitants. It ena enables us to be connected to our neighbours from Burkina Faso, from Mali, etc., so that we end up being at the heart of the uh, ECOWAS Economic Association that considers as its priority economic integration. Reference was also made to to uh, water programs for cities. This is extremely important. At the moment, we are carrying out a uh, program for uh, support to water and water management with the World Bank. And I must say something that is important in this respect. The idea is not just to have water for the sake of having water in cities. The idea is to make sure that the poorest have access to clean water and that they have access to water at the lowest cost. So the program that we have is a program linked to what we call uh, social branches or connections so that you have access to water at home. Not that you have to go to your neighbour's house with your bucket, but it allows every household to have a water pipe that comes to them so that they have water in their own courtyard. That is an important achievement. I would like to come back to another aspect relating to um, the assistance of the World Bank that is very important for my country. My neighbour has talked about refugees. We also have refugees. We have the problem of refugees that come to us, but we also have the problem of our own citizens who leave the country because of conflict. So this situation means, and I think it's something that needs to be said at this stage, I work in the field of development and have been doing so for years. I find that there has been huge progress. The fact that the World Bank actually takes into account the security situation, that it uh, takes into account the general frailty of a country in order to include that in its integration strategies of the country. Now, with the World Bank in Niger, we are implementing a programme aimed at refugees, but also uh, aimed at host communities. Host communities are displaced persons who have become completely upset by the conflict that uh, we are experiencing in Niger. It is terrorism, and the idea is to give them peace. These are people who were living peacefully along the river, who were engaged in irrigated agriculture. These people were 
forced to leave those areas, leave their villages, leave their fields in order to come and live like refugees in their own country. So the programme that we are implementing with the World Bank PACA, is a programme to support the host communities and the refugees. What is extraordinary is that this time we are implementing this programme with the cooperation of the UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees. So all these constraints linked to the issue of refugees, all the constraints linked to the issue of displaced persons, linked to the economic vulnerability that is now uh, prevalent in our region has been taken on board in these programmes. But you asked about how do we sustain this progress. Well, in addition to the efforts we're making, we are also carrying out reforms. All that is very new for us. We have never had to face displaced persons. Uh, nomadism is different. That's something that we like doing. It's, it's part of our culture. But displaced persons, persons who are forced to move, that is something new for us and in Niger we have adopted a law on that so that displaced persons are treated properly so that they are supported so that they are respected as though they were refugees in their own country all that is taken on board in this PACA program yesterday we signed a new commitment of the World Bank at regional level the uh, COLA uh, uh, program in order to enable countries that live around the Niger to be further supported by the World Bank so if you look Look, in this region, what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that hope is going to return, firstly, uh, in our daily life, but hope will also return at economic level because we will have social and economic uh, structures that will be put in place. We are going to create conditions for peace to return so that local populations can live their uh, life uh, peacefully. And we emphasize the situation of women and young people in this program. Thank you, David. Strongly about these issues. Thanks, Jill. Uh, so I, I wrote down several um, uh, single words. One is urgency. So the, 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 the problems aren't going away and in some cases are getting worse. Um, I wrote down the legacy debt. So if we look around the world, really, the developing world, there are uh, individual cases where maybe a, a big mistake was made in the past or there was a challenging situation like the one described in Jordan, and they're left with uh, a big chunk of debt that is, uh, is, is stopping the development. So I think we need a pattern kind of solution, or we need to find solutions in quite a few countries to this problem of legacy debt. I think going forward, transparency is going to be important, meaning as countries take on new debt, that the contracts be quite transparent. But that, that transparency, is uh, w when applied to the legacy debt is going to only make everyone very aware of the size of the problem. And uh, both Jordan and Nigeria have, uh, have, have those problems. Um, I wanted to mention uh, connectivity. So this issue of whether people have roads or paths or electricity or internet or uh, cell phones, some way to be connected to the, uh, to the market, to the economy, to the social structure is critical. Um, I'll draw the distinction between the b central bank regulatory policy in Kenya, which has found a way to have mobile banking be very robust, and the cost of transactions come down a lot. And a little bit to contrast, in West Africa, the central banks have moved slower on the regulatory front, and the transaction costs simply aren't coming down. So we're left with a connectivity uh, 
uh, that's very available in Kenya, even into rural areas that's not available in some of the other countries. I want to mention also in that context the importance of remittances. As countries find ways to be connected, then the remittance flow can be a big support uh, mechanism that isn't available if there's not some form of connectivity. I wanted to mention uh, regional solutions. So we, the Sahel was mentioned, and we're, the World Bank is working very hard on this issue of how do you create an environment where people, young people especially, are willing to stay in their home countries and not move in terms of economic uh, migrant uh, uh, movements, which, are, which can be destabilizing for, for others. And I appreciate the mention of UNHCR which uh, the bank works closely with. And final point is on peace. I was glad you mentioned that. And I do want to take note in Ethiopia of the Nobel Peace Prize for, for Prime Minister Abe and for the steps that he took and others in his region are taking to uh, allow peace to break out in some of the, the conflict areas. It's very important that leaders step up and speak up and say the word peace, and peace is right now, and, uh, and, and allow that to happen. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Jayla. Um, quick reactions. Uh, first, the point that uh, President Malpas mentioned about trade um, is important, particularly in a forward-looking sense. Uh, we, all, we all know about the, um, the continental free trade area, which opens immense opportunities opportunities that need to be seized. And I think related to that, of course, is the infrastructure, the roads, the connections that need to be made, as, as you mentioned. Otherwise, this would just be opportunities that would be wasted. So that, I think, is important. In terms of uh, um, more generally the debt point that was raised earlier, um, for us in Kenya, yes, we see this very much. Um, that we do need to deal with our debt levels. And uh, the point is that we have ran out of headroom for new, um, let's say, borrowing. And uh, that, let's say, old method of uh, borrowing for um, projects and things like that, that song has kind of um, waned. And we do need a new song which has to be uh, related to, say, other other possibilities of financing those projects, um, PPPs, and all the other methods. And I think here there's no shortage of uh, ingenious ideas that could deal with that. But still, yes, the debt needs to be dealt with, the stock. Um, but at the same time, and, and this I'm sure we'll be working closely with uh, um, all, including the World Bank, uh, um, officials on this, but I think the other points that need to be flagged, which is that uh, the, the effectiveness the, of the projects has also need to be looked at, meaning do we actually do effective project appraisal, and uh, yeah. is there the returns that we intend to see, and the returns have to be in, you know, also dealt with in terms of currencies and all the usual things. Um, and also, fundamentally, also ask the question, what about the overall deficit that is perhaps being financed in particular ways? So in some sense, it's a holistic um, solution and not just uh, one item in, in the list. Um, finally, uh, there's something that just triggered uh, my interest here. You mentioned, uh, President Malpas, the thing of uh, remittances. This is huge. Um, as the cost of remittances come down, and we've seen this in Kenya, the remittances actually accelerate. And the reason for that is people in uh, the diaspora can afford to send, let's say, $20 home, as opposed to waiting until it's $500 because the cost is, I don't know, uh, X amount. Actually, at this moment, the cost uh, of uh, remittances to Africa is quite large. And if you look at where the cost, uh, where the base of that cost is, it's actually in the advanced economies, in particular the US and the UK, where, the, where there is the initial leg, and that actually tends to be very expensive. So the point is, and we've seen this, um, 
in Kenya, as the cost has fallen, um, you can then send, or the diaspora will be sending smaller amounts which are really beneficial um, to the people at home instead of waiting until the end of the year or something like that. And also with the, with the remittances as they come back, you are also bringing back the people. And I think this is what happened, for instance, in India um, and other places where the takeoff really um, was uh, driven in part by the diaspora coming back and uh, getting involved in projects after their success elsewhere. So those are, I think, very good points that... Yeah. Uh, no, excellent point. Um, on remittances, we have a, a whole group at the World Bank looking at the costs of remittances, remittance corridors, and there are even targets in reducing them. And some countries have made progress, but some others are, are still struggling. And at the heart of it is compliance costs. And perhaps um, there's some uh, group of us working with the Innovation Lab uh, at the bank on trying to see if technology, electronic, know your client rules and other types of uh, interventions could help bring remittance costs down. Because as you said, it's critical for the poor, especially for women who, if they can get access to low cost um, remittances and can use it perhaps even to save for education of their children, for their own business prospects. So it is a really uh, key um, area, a policy area that um, we have been working very, very much on. And there are challenges. The costs are high, but hopefully we will make progress. You wanted to add something. No, I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned the headroom issue. Uh, it is it is a it is a concern, and I, I applaud the new G20 initiative of uh, of of thinking of of how to support countries in a more coordinated way through platformed uh, countries. I think this is a very healthy exercise because we cannot function in isolation in a daily mode of checking boxes for different. Uh, 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 partners, we have to act as a collective. We are owning our agenda, but we cannot we cannot do it without the international uh, uh, support for it. And I warn of the fatigue. As people stop seeing headlines in the newspaper, they move on. But the but the problem still is there, and it resides, and you have to carry it forward. And and this is an issue where I look forward to the World Bank really taking a leadership in in reminding the world of the importance of remaining engaged in this. The second issue I want to bring is hope. You talk about peace, President Malpass. I cannot agree more. And the most important element of peace are the youth, who are the future peacemakers. And we need to give them a real sense of hope. And hope against unemployment is a very difficult challenge to maintain. Therefore, I would call for today striking a healthy balance between fiscal stability and growth. Let's allow growth to happen. Let's allow jobs to be created. Let's allow hope to take place in the most conflicted regions of the world. I think that is a healthy outcome that deals with the intertemporal challenge I mentioned earlier. A lot of what we do is structural, but the business cycle is immediate, and I need to address it, and it fits the urgency. The other issue, I think, there is a hidden gem we have today, which is the digital revolution is, is equalizing the opportunity to access markets. In Jordan, Expedia has an office doing coding. Coding, not Arabization, not re regionalization, but coding. And it has the highest female to male ratio out of their offices worldwide. There are beautiful gems you can find in our countries, but you have to take a bet on us, and it has to be concerted in a way that empowers these women, gives them agency, and therefore raise the standard of living for families. So let's capture that revolution, but let's not be passive about waiting for it to happen on its own. We need to invest in growth. We need to invest in our institution. It does not come on its own at time of fiscal consolidation. Well, you're preaching to the crier. Um, so, um, David, President Malpass, you have been visiting many countries uh, in the six months uh, you have been our president. You have heard also from the esteemed panelists as to what they are um, 
achieving, what they are struggling with, and the challenges. Can you give us some uh, thoughts on some views as to what you have seen in the different countries you visited and how that should impact our work going forward? Okay, I guess so, but I'll, I'll uh, make a couple points as well. So the general point as far as where I visited is each country is so different. The, and the, the, the problems, while I've tried to draw some parallels here today in terms of uh, refugees or in terms of debt, the solutions really are very much uh, in the countries themselves. And what we're trying to do is have country directors feel very empowered both at the World Bank, at IFC, at MEGA, and uh, have them engaged in the country. And uh, above all, having the country feel like it owns the program and, and is guiding uh, the, the, the reforms that are coming out of it. So I'll make that general point. And then I wanted to come back to the, uh, issue, of, the issue of remittances and the issue of uh, empowerment. Um, uh, one of the th things that strikes me is as transaction costs go down, it enables the poor and women and small businesses to get into the market. Because one of the, one of the common things in economics is barriers to entry are one of the bo biggest costs. That might be trade facilitation, uh, it might be transaction costs in terms of uh, 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 actual um, transactions for purchasing raw materials. Um, and um, the remittance barrier is actually large. I, I was with, the, with a senior European yesterday who was saying from his, from his country to Brazil, the transaction cost, and these are th therefore quite advanced financial systems, the transaction costs are giant in terms of uh, m making a transaction. So if we can work on getting those costs down and the barriers to entry for small, small businesses, that, um, that will be very empowering for women because mm -hmm. they're often the new participant. They're the one that's been left out in, in the past. So I think we have to work uh, extra hard on transaction costs, and that is done country by country with these technology systems. Thank you. And I'd like to give the last word, if that's okay with the panel, to Madame Kane. Um, you heard uh, what President Malpass just said about um, including women. As a women minister who is um, so accomplished, what are your thoughts? What do you recommend us to focus on? Thank you. I am very happy to hear that the president of the World Bank is very committed for uh, the empowerment of women. I think this is very important. And the seminar on the state of Africa that will be um, devoted to the empowerment of women uh, is, um, I think, a way of proving that the World Bank is committed for the empowerment of women. I told you that my greatest joy is this initiative that allows us to reduce poverty. In Niger, we have achieved significant progress because we have managed to reduce poverty by several percentage points. In relative terms, we are at 44% of poverty rate, and we have even brought down the extreme poverty rate as well. But, but, because of the population growth. Admittedly, we have brought down the poverty rate, but the number of poor people has increased. The number of poor people has increased because the population growth is so strong that it annihilates our efforts to reduce poverty, and that is a real challenge. That is why we are uh, implementing robust policies so that the fertility index, which is the highest in the world in Niger, can be in line with the resources of the country. So that is uh, what is driving us. And we are making progress in this respect. For this reason, empowerment of women in this context is of paramount importance.
And we have a uh, president asked the World Bank to carry out a study. And this study has shown that by 2030, if we manage to eliminate inequality, gender inequality in terms of employment, in terms of the status of women, um, or several aspects of this gender inequality health, for instance, as well, that would allow us to increase our GDP in 2030 of 25 by 25 percent. That is huge. And it shows that the empowerment of women is not just uh, a slogan or a sort of militant feminist attitude. No, no, no. I strongly believe that the economic empowerment of women will allow countries to progress economically, that it has a definite impact on population growth, that it has a definite impact on everything related to the human capital, because it is women who fund the education of their children. So if women are economically empowered, then they are in a stronger position to educate their children. So. The solution, admittedly, debt and all that is important, but the solution for economic progress in our country, in addition to what we have already said, is the empowerment of women. We cannot do without. I would like to thank the panel. It was a very good discussion and uh, really appreciate it. I want to say one last thing, actually. Yes. A couple of days ago, we had the Nobel Economic Prize winners, um, three of them, and one of them is actually a woman, and it's on poverty, on their work on poverty. And I would like to just close by saying, she, Esther Duflo has a paper, Economists as Plumbers, and I'd like to think that in the World Bank, we're all plumbers to try to understand the challenges you have and to support you. Thank you very much.